everybody. Welcome to the Sheepdog Project. One of the things that Tim and I get emailed about the most is, uh, aside from uh, what gun should I buy, is what supplements should I be taking? What should my diet be like? Uh, what's a good resource to look to for what I should and should not be eating? I get asked that question quite a bit, and I have up until now felt pretty comfortable asking it, but I've noticed the more that I answer that question, the more complex it becomes and the more and more in-depth these questions are becoming. So I know, recognize I'm not the smartest guy on the block, so I need to turn to somebody that's an expert. And for that reason, I have asked my good friend, Dr. Drew Wingy, to join us today to talk about that very subject, supplements. Drew, welcome to the Sheepdog Project, brother. Thanks, buddy. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, always. I'm glad you're here to help me sort through this because uh, for those of my listeners that don't know uh, and haven't read your book, which they need to go to the Sheepdog store and purchase, um, Drew has made it really his life's work. In addition to being uh, an Air, a former Air Force officer, combat deployed multiple times, uh, previously a family medicine physician, an emergency mm-hmm. medicine physician, uh, an age management physician. Did you also, uh, you also have a bariatric certification, don't you? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a yeah, I'm a member of the American Board yeah. of Obesity Medicine. Yes. Um, although I don't practice obesity medicine per se, I uh, I just got really interested in it and joined up. So. Uh, he's also a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt. He's the guy who got me into Jiu-Jitsu, uh, and he's an absolute beast in the gym. So uh, he's somebody who talks the talk and walks the walk. He's not one of these little pencil necks who's out there telling you <laughs> how to be big and strong when they've never even picked up a kettlebell themselves. This is somebody that actually knows. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your, your expertise. <laughs> Hopefully now when people email me, I can just send them a link to this podcast and they'll answer literally all their questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. That's that's quite an intro, man. <laughs> well, but you know what? I get asked, I mean, as, as often as you do, I mean, it's, it's, I'm constantly being asked about nutritional supplements um, uh, for years. I've been asked about them. Um, and um, it's, I don't know, it's just an interesting, uh, it's an interesting topic because everybody's looking for something they can take to give them an edge. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I, what I always tell folks is, you know, they're called supplements for a reason. You know, um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take them. In fact, uh, I'm going to go into a few that I think almost everybody should take. But there's no shortcut. You know, you've got to have your training on point. You've got to have your nutrition on point. you got to do it consistently day in and day out. Um, or, you know, taking um, all these extra supplements and all these popping these pills and powders, um, you're wasting your time, really, because the you know, the bang for your buck is in training hard, recovering adequately, and eating a good diet. And we can, you know, we can talk at length about what constitutes a good diet. But most, I think most of your listeners have some idea what that looks like. So, you know, uh, I think Menser said something years ago, Mike Menser, about uh, supplements. And he, he kind of made the analogy that, that going out and buying, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of supplements every day is like, uh, buying expensive suntan lotion and then going out at midnight, um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and expecting something to happen. Right. Um, and so you've got to put the work in, uh, or else really you're just wasting your time and your money. Um, and my God, you can waste a lot of money on supplements. I mean, the, the industry is just huge. It's, if it's not a billion dollar industry, it's probably getting close to it. Um, I mean, everywhere you look, there's somebody that's trying to sell you something. Um, so what I what I have done um, for myself and then for you know for people that ask is really try to get into this you know into the nitty gritty of what the science shows um, and when you do that you find a couple things one we don't really know that much about nutritional supplements um, the quality of the research out there is not very good um, I mean you remember in you know in residency and you know in things like Journal Club I mean we would talk about the glaring holes and all of these, uh, you know, medical journal um, uh, studies that were out there that had several thousand people in them, you know, and and we would talk about, you know, the major flaws that were in those. Well, if you look at the same kind of literature for nutritional supplements, I mean, it's so much worse. Um, There's studies with like... 
Go, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, a lot, a lot of the people, the problem is, in my opinion, a lot of the people who are doing the research on supplements have an agenda. So of course. Th- there's, so, yeah, there's so much skewed research yeah. out there just based yeah. on that and that alone. I mean, there, yeah. there's, and, there, it, it, right? whether it's for or against, because I, I know people that have right. made it, they're, they're physicians who've just about made it their life's work to disprove supplementation. Mm-hmm. And, and then you Absolutely. have people in the Absolutely. supplement industry who they want to sell more supplements. So obviously they Absolutely. do studies that skew towards supplementation. Exactly. And that's a problem in the medical research too, is big pharma, you know, has got their fingers in, in everything. And, right. you know, if you, you look at the largest source of funding from those studies, it comes from big pharma. Um, so it's, you have to kind of look and try to find um, unbiased research, which can be a real challenge. But in, you know, in the supplement world, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a study that has more than like 50 people in it, right. um, you know, or 20. And so it might be, you know, the conclusions that they get might be what they call statistically significant in this small group of people, but it's really hard to correlate that and say, well, how does that translate into me? Or how does it translate into somebody else or you or, you know, an older person, a kid? It, I mean, good luck. Yeah. Good luck with that. So, um, so with that caveat, um, you know, the, the, I have tried to boil things down to, um, you know, taking the things that I really think have got good evidence that are not also going to break my pocketbook because as you know, you can spend hundreds of dollars a month. Um, and if, if, if every time a new supplement study came out, um, on a new supplement, you know, if I spent money on that, I mean, it'd be a mortgage right. on my house. <laughs> um, the good news is you don't need all that crap. There's very little, there's, there's a small number of things I think that most people would benefit from and they're, um, thankfully not that expensive. So, um, so supplements are super important. If you'd asked me 10 or 15 years ago, I probably would have given you the same line that most doctors do is, oh, you don't, you know, you don't need supplements. You just eat a well-balanced diet, um, well, and that's, which is what they taught us in med school. Yeah, right? and that's a great, that's a great intro. Before we go into kind of breaking down a day, um, mm-hmm. what do you, what do you say to that? I mean, because that, that's something that I've always heard. That's what I heard in medical school. It's like, if you eat, right. if you eat you know, your green leafy vegetables and your lean meats and your whole grains, um, you know, you're going to get your, you know, uh, you're going to get your niacin here. You're going to get your zinc here. Mm -hmm, You're going to get your, your vitamins, your trace minerals here and here, uh, your, your appropriate amount of good fats and bad fats. What do you say to that? What's, what's your response? Well, I, you know, I, I would say that the, uh, the research does not substantiate that claim. Um, although it makes, I mean, it sort of makes intuitive sense, but it's kind of a cop out too. Mm-hmm. You know, they used to tell us, well, just, you know, just eat a well-balanced diet, but then they actually never told us what that really was, mm-hmm. you know? So we just parrot that to our patients and be like, just eat a well-balanced diet. And they're like, uh, when they want specifics, you're kind of, you know, at a loss. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there's been a number of studies coming out over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years looking at, you know, how much of specific, specific, we'll look at micronutrients, for example. Um, if you eat, um, you know, a relative, what's considered a relatively healthy um, diet, you know, are you reaching the RDAs, which is kind of what the government has set as some sort of baseline targets. Mm-hmm. Um, and I won't go too into that because those have a huge they've got problems as well. Those those numbers, in my opinion, are not, um, not entirely accurate, but for example, um, there's one that comes to mind where they compared, like if you ate the standard Atkins diet and then they compared it to the dash diet, which is, um, you know, a low sodium, mostly vegan diet, uh, compared to Mediterranean. And then they looked at the average caloric intake. If you had like 2,200 calories a day of each one of those diets, where would you come up on the RDA across, you know, a dozen to 20 plus micronutrients? And almost all of them were at the end of the day, less than 100% of what the RDA was, was mandating. Um, and so they said for, you know, for some of them, you'd have to eat up to 10,000 calories a day of, of the DASH diet, for example, to get 100% plus of everything across the board that you're supposed to get. Um, so that's, man, I don't I could probably eat 10,000 calories, but yeah. I, That's a lot of work. <laughs> not yeah. not consistently, man, yeah. not consistently. Um, so, you know, it's. 
unfortunately, even if you try to eat as healthy as you possibly can, I mean, it's certainly better than eating the standard Western diet, mm -hmm. but the odds are that is you're going to come up shy. Um, not so much that you're going to have clinical deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not going to get scurvy, <laughs> right. per se, and your teeth aren't going to fall out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a big difference between getting enough so you don't have a clinical deficiency versus what's the right amount for optimal health. Those are two different things. They're totally different numbers. Right. Um, and a couple and so of, that's where supplements come in. A couple of confounders here, too, that I don't think ever really get addressed. Uh, and Well, one of, one of them, this is something that I heard years ago, one of the arguments mm -hmm. for supplementation of vitamins, minerals, um, and mm -hmm. certain, certain micronutrients was... Uh, Yes, if you ate the diet that uh, that we're designed to eat, grown properly organically mm -hmm. in soil mm -hmm. that had not been leached from over farming, um, that yes, uh, chemicals yes, yes. had not been added to, that hormones had not been added to in the case of livestock, uh, and, and you ate you know kind of a quasi paleo type diet that we were designed for, yes, you would be getting the proper amount of nutrients. Um, however. Mm -hmm. All of those things confound it. And we also have to look at the mm -hmm. fact that, that uh, ancient man was not the healthiest. <laughs> I mean, he, he, it, didn't, he didn't necessarily... That's a great point. He didn't necessarily eat the paleo diet because it was the best diet for him. It was the diet that was right. available. And, I, and, I do, and I'm not bashing yeah. on paleo because, I, like I say, I'm kind of a quasi-paleo nope. kind of guy. The other confounder that I don't think it's brought into it is when you're talking about, you use the key word for me, is optimal performance. What is optimal yes. performance for somebody who is a nine to five office worker versus somebody who is a special forces operator or a professional athlete? When we're talking about that, yes. we're talking about a higher metabolic demand. Uh, and anytime you have more metabolic demand, more cell turnover, you're talking about a greater need. You know, there's more ATP, adenosine triphosphate, you know, being manufactured mm -hmm. here. Everything that mm -hmm. goes into that, all the micronutrients, you're going to need more zinc for soft tissue repair. You're going to mm -hmm. need more Absolutely. magnesium at the end of the day for muscle relaxation uh, mm -hmm. and and overnight uh, rest and recuperative phase. You're going to need more protein almost all the time. You know, the I, that was the Without first question. thing that was the first thing that I found out from from my trainer was you're not you're eating half the amount of protein that you need to be eating. You yeah. need to increase your protein. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's talk about absolutely. this. Let's talk about this in the form. This is I, this is how I always like to break it down. I think this will, this will probably be yeah. the easiest for everybody. To keep us kind of mm -hmm. linear. What uh, you know, I break my stuff. I have stuff that I take in the morning. I have I have stuff that I take uh, around midday. Uh, you know, either either peri workout or whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. And I have mm -hmm. stuff that I take uh, in the evening. Um, so yeah. I let, let's if you don't mind, let's break it down that that way. Sure. What's what's nope, your no, not at all. You that's, uh, that's kind of how I do it as well. Um, although um, I mainly do the bulk of my supplements are in the morning, and then I got a few things that I take at night um, as well. Um, and then uh, yeah, I, I may take some stuff before a workout. Um, we'll talk about that too. Okay. So um, you know, number one, I I, I take a multivitamin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not fancy. Uh, and it's uh, it's not expensive, but I consider it a uh, kind of an insurance policy, essentially, just to make sure that I'm not um, having any uh, you know potential uh, micronutrient deficiencies or um, you know things along those lines. Um, I I see very little downside to doing that. In fact, I don't really see any downside to doing that. Um, um, as long as, as a male, you're not taking one that has iron in it, because iron can build up in the in the male and can cause problems. But um, yeah, I mean, I start off with a multivitamin, and then I take my fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I have talked a lot about about fish oil, mm -hmm. and I, I'm I'm pretty pretty bullish on fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, I will say a lot of the more recent research is really, um, you know, it's saying not surprisingly that it's probably better to. Um, get the bulk of your DHA and EPA, which are the two active ingredients, if you can, from actual oily fish. Right. Um, so, uh, but that's, yeah, that doesn't mean there's not benefits. That's, unless you want mercury poisoning, though, nowadays, that's, <laughs> right. that's, so that, that's I mean, a little that's bit a, more that's challenging. A, so on, yeah, right. I mean, that's that's a huge yeah. person, you know, a, a huge point. Um, uh, you know, hey, especially if you're a female of childbearing age, right, mm -hmm. and you might, you consider having a, a child or becoming pregnant, you don't want to be 
um, loading your tissues with mercury. Um, if you want to go the fish route, um, sardines have the lowest mercury counts. Mm -hmm. Basically, the longer lived the fish is, the more time they have to build up mercury in their tissues, mm -hmm. um, which is why you shouldn't eat shark. <laughs> yeah, or, uh, no or, shark or uh, uh, turtles. Turtle soup, I think, is pretty much illegal now. Anyway, but I, that, that would probably. I, I think yeah, <laughs> it's not. It should be. Yeah, yeah. Turtles probably not for many reasons. Don't eat turtles. Yeah. Um, but. Um, yeah, the sardines, if you can handle the, the smell and the fishy fishy taste, um, which I actually like, but I, I've been banned from eating those at work, so I, I don't do sardines at work anymore. Yeah, they don't, <laughs> it's, it's generally not appreciated when you pop open a can of sardines in the pit in the emergency room. It's not. It, yeah. they, just don't, it's, they, don't, it's they don't understand that I'm trying to be healthy. It's generally frowned upon. <laughs> it is. I get banished yeah. to my office. Now, I'm, but I'm taking, I take, I'm oh, taking krill oil now. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's another great source yeah. um, as well. Yeah, do you, do you like that better? Or is it you know less what? fishy? I, I suppose it, it's less fishy. I don't get the belt. I don't get the yeah. fish oil belches. Um, oh yeah, which yeah. which I like. And so yeah. I take a, a krill oil gel cap in the morning, and I take one at night. Um, I was doing most of the fish oils that are out there. The capsules are just so huge. Um, they are, and I don't yeah. do, I don't do well with large pills anyway. And then on top of that, yeah. uh, walking around for an hour afterwards, you know, belching up fish oil, right, uh, was just right. annoying exactly. to me. So yeah. uh, so I like yeah. the krill oil. It's smaller. Um, it's a little bit more convenient, and I think uh, mm -hmm. krill are probably pretty short lived. So I think uh, they're they're probably on the safe on the safe are, end. Yeah. yeah, I've never tried krill oil, but uh, yeah, I might uh, might give it a shot. Yeah. What I do is I. Because I've had the same problems with fish oil as you have, is is the fish burps afterwards, and then, you know, to get what I think is an a, a, an optimal dose of DHA and EPA, which is about two, at least two grams, two to four grams per day. Um, you know, with some of these standard fish oil capsules, you're taking like twelve a day. Yeah. You know, and so that's you know, no wonder you got fish burps. You got a belly full of fish oil. Um, so I have I've come across a few brands. The one I'm using right now, and this is not an endorsement. I'm gonna get paid for pocket supplements, but um, there's a triple strength uh, omega-3 fish oil brand by a company called Bronson. Mm -hmm. And so two of their two of their soft gels have um, over two grams of DHA and EPA combined mm -hmm. in it. So, okay. um, so I take two of those in the morning and I take two at night. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, vo you know, they're just very concentrated so you don't get the big, you know, the, the fish burps and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So um, it's a little bit more expensive, um, but, you know, God, I was popping like five regular fish oil pills in the morning and another five at night and yeah it wasn't good that's rough Bef so, before but I there's a lot of to, benefits uh, to fish oil before i switched to krill i was doing the mm -hmm. uh, the slurries the uh, oh okay yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah. it comes in like a mint flavor and you do like a tablespoon yeah. in the morning uh and that, that yeah. pretty much gives you all you need and it neutralizes the fish taste huh? it completely completely yeah and it, it made it a lot more palatable that's amazing. um cool so what what are you you were getting ready to talk about the benefits of fish oil? So what are they? Yeah, yeah, I think across the board. I mean, most people who if you eat a Western diet, you probably need to supplement uh, or just dramatically increase your oily fish intake because um, you know fish oil. I mean, God, you look at you look at the, the literature. I mean, there's benefits um, in almost every single organ system. Yeah, from the brain, definitely the heart. We know about the effects with lipids. Um, it has you know, fairly effective anti-inflammatory um, uh, properties. So mm -hmm. people with, um, you know, inflammatory autoimmune uh, conditions tend to stand some some benefit potentially. Um, people with asthma can benefit from it. Um, and it all basically boils down to this ratio between omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Um, they all, you know, without getting into too much biochemistry, they act in opposition Fish oil, specifically the DHA and EPA, are omega threes, so they have this anti-inflammatory, um, you know, property to them, among other things. Omega sixes, which are still just as important, they have sort of a pro-inflammatory um, effect in the body. The problem in the Western diet is, you know, you should have this ideally golden one-to-one -one ratio where omega three to omega six are. Your, your total intake is roughly e equal. But if you eat an average Western diet, they say it's like 15 to 1 or 16 to 1. Mm -hmm. So you're just wildly out of, you're just totally out of balance. Right. Um, you know, and so you've got this pro-inflammatory environment, um, which spills over into, you know, a number of different health issues. So the idea with 
supplementing fish oil is that you can start bringing that ratio down closer to one to one. Um, and so, you know, again, the studies will vary, but anywhere between two and gra- two and four grams a day mm-hmm. seems to be kind of the sweet spot. Um, although there's lots of studies that show taking less than that can help too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, if your ratio is 16 to one, I mean, even getting to eight to one would you'd stand to benefit from that. Sure. Um, yeah. so, um, I think it's, I think it's pretty important. Um, I think it's one of the kind of the core essential nutritional supplements that I recommend, um, especially if you've got a history of heart disease, um, that sort of thing. But even if you're an athlete, I mean, it, um, it actually, there's some studies showing it increases protein synthesis. Uh, you can get, you'll be less sore after a workout if you supplement with fish oil. I, I've certainly so noticed that. Yeah, I have two. Yeah. I have two, and I notice it when I miss it um, yeah. on my workouts. So uh, I, I do think that that's a real phenomenon. Um, and again, you know, there, there's no downside. You know, it's you can't really overdose on fish oil. You know, I suppose theoretically you could. But, uh, there was um, there was one study out there that that said there was a possible link to prostate cancer, but it was in dosages. I want to say yeah. eight, eight times what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was, exactly. It was and and I know, I'm familiar dosages. with that study yeah. too. And that is the only one that, yeah. that I'm aware of that that has ever shown anything like that. And it was a pretty weak link um, as well. The most of the cancer studies show, if anything, they show reduced rates, yes. specifically like colon and breast cancer. Right. So, um, so I would not let that stand in your way of taking taking fish oil. I think it's I think it's a good thing. No, um, nor would it's I. And- widely available. I, I've noticed since taking either either fish oil or, and or krill oil, and uh, I've added turmeric, that just oh, my, really? okay. yeah, my yeah. my normal daily soreness is vastly mm-hmm. improved. My po- post workout soreness cool. vastly improved. There's uh, you know, previously um, going to do a, a, a hard roll at you know typically. Uh, Thursday night jujitsu is always the hardest because you kick everybody's ass going into yeah. the weekend. Uh, <laughs> it used to be Friday mornings were just completely unbearable for me uh, yeah. as an old guy waking up. You know, it's it literally mm-hmm. everything from my neck uh, down. Yeah. It was just an extreme I pain, know the and and it's it's not it's not an issue for me anymore. I mean, I you know I still have a little bit yeah. of morning soreness. I get up, I stretch out, and sure. uh, I get up. Today's Friday. I got up. I did a very hard night of sparring last night. Um, I got up today, and I was within 45 minutes of waking up. I was at the box doing wall walks and throwing 100 pound D ball over my shoulder and sled pushes. And there's no nice. no way before I change my supplement routine that I could have been doing that. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, and you know, and you're doing everything else right as well. So, you know, you you stand. To, you're going to get the most benefit out of fish oil because you've got all those other boxes checked mm-hmm. as well so, so we talk, you can't so, just be a slug and eat McDonald's right and right and you can't, and expect to feel, you to can't feel take, like a million bucks you can't sit there watching tv and drinking a whey protein shake uh and and taking all the all the right supplements if you're not doing if you're right. not putting in the work that goes along with it yeah um, yeah what else do you recommend not as part of the morning um so probably the one of the most important ones out there, and, and it's hard for me to say which is the most important. But um, it, if I had, if you had to pin me down and say what's the most important thing, like across most, plus all Americans, I would probably say vitamin D, mm-hmm. um, tied with magnesium, which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, vitamin D is incredibly important, um, and a lot of this stuff on vitamin D, this new research, it's been out, it's only been out the last few years where we've realized that. Mm-hmm. Um, just how crucial it is. I mean, it's it's not really a. It's called a vitamin, but it's really not. It's actually more of a hormone. Um, and I mean, from your cognition to we've always known about the you know the effects on bone health, and that's pretty important. Calcium and vitamin D kind of go together with that. Um, but if you look at you know rates of coronary artery disease, uh, rates of stroke, blood pressure, um, insulin sensitivity, and type two diabetics. Um, massive effects across across the board um it's really common to have severe vitamin d deficiency sometimes in multiple sclerosis Mm -hmm. so we know it it affects the brain Mm -hmm. um and it it probably affects 
other tissues in ways that we don't even know yet. Um, so it's it's crucially crucially important, and it's so common to be um, deficient. Um, you know, even if you live in a sunny climate, because even if you know, like you're down in Texas, you have a lot more sunlight than I do here in Oregon. Um, but how much of that is actually spent outside with your shirt off? You right. know, getting a full dose of of, uh, of sunlight. Right. The majority of Americans don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's I've, I've actually been shocked. Like the times I've checked it in patients, um, it, I mean it's almost universally low. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that gets to you know we don't really know what the optimal level is, but we definitely are getting we're we're getting in the right ballpark. Um, the vitamin D society. Um, which is a bunch of scientists that get together, I think, every few months and talk about vitamin D. Sounds pretty exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't I want to get invited to that party. Um, those guys, they recommend levels of like 100 to 150 micrograms uh, per milliliter, which is that, that's on the very high end, wow. which is way, way higher. Um, most of the standard assays out there say that, um, you know, under 30, um, is, is considered low. Um, and most of the studies show you start getting significant benefit above 30 if you can get to 50. But I'll be honest with you, I went through their website and looked at their literature. I mean, they've got, they make a good case for pushing that vitamin D level higher, mm-hmm. um, with supplementation to over a hundred. Wow. Um, the, you know, the, the thing is you're just not going to reach that without supplementation. There's, mm-hmm. there's no way no, I mean, if you you're look not outside, get, not it would get, be, you basically have to sit outside, sit outside with your shirt off and drink whole milk all day long. Pretty much. That, yeah. And yeah. even then yeah. you might not get that <laughs> over a hundred. Um, yeah, and there's been so, also you, you mentioned cognition. There's some been some really strong it, yep. strong studies linking vitamin D deficiency to early onset Alzheimer's. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and ADHD and mm-hmm. bipolar disorder. Um, it's I mean, there, there's receptors for vitamin D in practically every single tissue in the body, mm-hmm. um, and so um, it's so easy to fix it. It's so cheap. Um, and and they're truly, I mean, you have to really mega dose vitamin D to start running into toxicity. Um, it, it's I know it's a you know it's considered a fat soluble vitamin, um, so there's theoretical dangers if you go incredibly high, but um, it, that's just not going to happen if you take reasonable doses. So um, the the best way, obviously, to find out what your vitamin D level is, go to your doctor, ask them to check it, mm-hmm. um, and they can do that for you, and then then you'll know because that's. And that's what I do. I, I check my own labs every six months to um, to get my you know various vitamin levels and things like that dialed in. Um, so um, minimum generally about two thousand I use a day. Some people can get away with less. It just depends on what your level is. Um, I will tell you for me, I my levels sit around eighty. Um, 80 micrograms per ml, and I take ten thousand I use a day. Okay. Um, and so I'm happy with that. I feel great. You know, I, I don't feel the need to push it. I don't know that, you know, I would benefit that much from going higher than that. Um, if there's better data that says I would, then I'll do it. If it says I should back off, I'll do that later. Um, but 10,000 is a lot. Like, you won't see very many official recommendations saying that you take that much. Mm-hmm. But I do that based off of my, my blood work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's important to just not arbitrarily shotgun things. Um right. And, 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 you know, it, it's a standard test and any family physician, internal medicine doc can order it for you. Um, and, um, and then you can get a little bit of guidance on dosages and stuff like that. So, so vitamin D is huge. Um, now almost everybody should be taking vitamin D. When you supplement your vitamin D, do you specifically go for D3? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. And yeah. The, there, and- there's D2. It's, it's less bio, biologically active. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get D2. I've seen it out there, but almost all the, the stuff that you pick up, um, you know, even a Walmart brand is going to be vitamin D3, and that's what you want. Yeah, and for those that don't so, know, uh, D3, so if you get vitamin D in its regular form, you, your body has to, con- we talked about sunlight, your body has to convert that to D3 or, or col- uh, cholecalciferol uh, mm-hmm. using the sunlight. But if you take it as D3, you're getting the form that your body can use, and that's the form that I take as well. Yep, exactly. And I think um, I, I've never seen any official recommendations that you even need to consider taking the other kinds. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so just take vitamin D. Vitamin D and fish oil, man. Yeah. Good so, for you. So in the it's morning, taken. multivitamin, 
vitamin D, fish oil, anything else? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I take uh, I take creatine, um, and you know I've also talked a lot about that. Um, now, creatine is kind of interesting. It's been around forever. Um, it's probably one of the, if not the most well studied. Uh, nutritional supplement out there because um, when it came on the scene, I mean, athletes started seeing real measurable performance improvements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these other things we've talked about are good for you in the long run, mm -hmm. but there's not very many things you can take immediately. And then within just a few weeks, see, you know, a, a measurable improvement in athletic performance, but creatine for the most part is one of those things. Um, what's, so what's creatine the... for, for your, yeah, I was going to say the the Reader's Digest version for why people need to take creatine. Okay, so creatine, your body, your muscles are loaded with creatine. It's part of part of who you are. Uh, all animal tissues have it as well. So it's not some weird exogenous thing that you're putting into your body. Um, the ability to perform high intensity, uh, explosive uh, exercise and generate a lot of muscular power is is determined by um, how much ATP you have in your muscles. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as you know, when you contract a muscle, the ATP gets cleaved, adenosine triphosphate goes to adenosine diphosphate, you lose a phosphate, mm -hmm. okay? In order to keep going and keep pushing, you gotta get that phosphate back onto an ADP and make more ATP. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what creatine does. Creatine binds phosphate and it's a phosphate pool. Mm -hmm. So you can keep that keep that going. Now you only have a limited amount of creatinine in your, in your muscle tissue. So that's why you can't sprint for two miles. You know, you can only sprint for, you know, hundred meters, 200 meters, depending on, you know, um, how you are. So what they found is that if you load the muscle with creatine, you increase the amount of phosphate that's available to keep that cycle going. So if you're running a hundred meter dash as fast as you possibly can, you may ran, run out of, of, uh, phosphate and run out of ATP at the 50 or 60 meter mark, um, and then start slowing down. Um, the idea is that with creatine, now you've got this extra pool of phosphate. You may not slow down mm -hmm. for another 10 yards or 10 meters or 20 meters even. Um, so and there's it's pretty rock like, solid data showing that's the case. It, it's almost like, uh, you know, you always, when you go to the gas pump now, it gives you the option. Do you want to add an octane booster? to this yes or no yeah it's a it, it, yeah. creatine is almost like an octane booster for your cells basically yeah i mean it's, it's an extra pool of available energy mm -hmm. that lets you work harder and so when you work harder you get a little bit more muscle breakdown which mm -hmm. in the long run results in greater protein synthesis and greater gains in muscle mass um at least that's the idea and that does seem to be the case now um, let me let me ask you this this is this is something i remember hearing from two things that i always remember hearing about creatine uh, one is that it has to be taken with some form of carbohydrate, whether it's fructose or whatever it is. Can you hear me, Drew? Drew, did I lose you? Uh, yeah, just for a second. But uh, I think okay. you're back. Uh, I, right. I was saying that you know one thing that I had heard from way back uh, when it comes to creatine is it has to be taken with some type of car carbohydrate in order to get taken right. into the cells. Right. Is that true? Yeah. Um, doesn't have to. Um, you can get increased absorption if you take it with some carbohydrate and actually a little bit of protein helps mm -hmm. too. Um, so somewhere, most of the studies are like 50 grams of a you know relatively medium to high glycemic um, index um, carbohydrate. So mm -hmm. um, I, I used to put it in grape juice mm -hmm. when I was in when I was in college. That's I put it. In, um, I used to put it in white grape juice because I it was I thought it was a little bit less acidic. And, uh, and yeah, kinda, sure, kinda, and, and and had and yeah. has a little bit higher. Uh, kind of overall water content, which is why I liked it. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, but having said that, you, you know, if you're on a ketogenic diet, for example, you know, you can still get your levels up. You can still saturate the muscle adequately with, without spiking uh, your insulin levels with carbohydrates mm -hmm. um, because you are taking some protein, which, you know, a little protein does spike insulin levels a little bit. Um, it may just take you a couple more days potentially mm -hmm. to get, up to the top, um, you know, the top tiers of muscle saturation. So I haven't seen any specific studies saying, you know, how long, how much longer it might take, but mm -hmm. theoretically that would be the case. Um, you know me, I'm on a pretty low carbohydrate diet year round, uh, not always ketogenic, but, um, yeah, I still take, 
creatine and I still benefit from it. Okay. Um, and I haven't had any issues. So, but that was, yeah, when it first came out, you have to take it with, you know, sugar of some kind. And, um, turns out that's probably not, not the case. Okay. So. The other thing that, that I always remember about creatine, uh, and this was an issue, of course, you know, it, in the military, all it takes is a, is a few people to do stuff wrong, kind of screw it up, become heat casualties or whatever it might be. You know, yep. and, I, and I remember uh, multiple times it's come up with the DOD. DOD was on the uh, literally on the verge of banning creatine, saying that if you were active duty, yeah. you couldn't take creatine. Um, but the big right. warning that I've always heard is, and and I, from hearing this before I went to medical school, and not fully, even as a medic, not fully understanding the science behind it, but now retroactively understanding a little bit more. Because uh, creatine driving things intercellularly and taking water with it, there was all it was always preached that if you're going to take creatine, you should be monitoring your hydration status anyway. But with creatine, that mm-hmm. was even more important because you were moving more of the water intercellular, and your mm-hmm. likelihood of basically becoming dehydrated because of that was higher. Is that true? Um, short answer is no. Okay. Um, you, yeah, you're you're totally right that it does um, it it does pull. It's an osmotic agent, right? right. So it pulls fluid into muscle cells, um, which is a good thing, right? It makes your muscles swell. Right. Um, you know, being adequately hydrated is is just as much about intracellular hydration as it is how much circulating blood volume you have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you can theoretically be, you know, dehydrated within your cells, but have what looks like you know, on a first pass, you know, normal hydration level, uh, or normal blood volume. So, um, creatine is not really a, so, you know, we used to think it was, it could cause heat cramps and stuff like that. It's really not the case. If you're getting heat cramps, um, you know, you, you need to cool down, um, and you need to drink more water. You know, it's, it's not, it's not creatine causing that. Right. Um, but I, I, I understand, I understand where that concern came from. Um, but you know, the DOD, you know, how I mean, they, they have knee jerk reactions to just about everything. Sure. Um, and they're quick, quick to point fingers. Um, you know, they, they had a memo years ago going around and saying, you know, watch out for renal failure because they thought that creat- creatine was the same as creatinine. creatinine. <laughs> uh, and which is not, they're not the same thing. Right. And that's a, um, that's a scientific discussion. We don't need to get into for the listeners, but it's, we don't need to, it, it's but, kind of, it's kind of yeah. funny that they even, even thought that. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. So, Creatine is it's it is extremely safe. Um, I mean, it's been around so long, um, and um, I, there really is no downside to it. We're finding some interesting things about it that go beyond just muscular performance, though. Um, getting back to we we're talking about Alzheimer's and cognitive decline and things like that. There's some studies coming out now that show that elderly people tend to benefit from it uh, or could benefit from it um, as well. Um, with all this stuff, we need more studies, but I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's not just something involved in, um, in, uh, in muscles, you know, it's not, it goes beyond just a sports supplementation. So, so I take five grams a day. Uh, they used to think you have to load with this stuff, but mm-hmm. you don't, um, five grams a day consistently will get you where, where you need to be. Um, I take the capsules. So I do two and a half grams in the morning and then two and a half grams at night. Um, I just found over the years, I started to get some stomach upset from the powder, um, you know, get, get the, the gurgles, which, uh, is not good before I go to the gym. So, um, but I know a lot of people don't have that issue. So I just do the capsules. They're a little more expensive. Um, and I split it up twice a day, okay. which you don't have to do, by the way. I, I just, I just do that to, to keep my stomach in check. Sure. So, uh, multivitamin, fish oil, absolutely, D- D3, yeah. and creatine. That that's that's your morning load. Um. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, and then uh, you know, I'm not going to count protein powder as a supplement in there. I mean, I consider that a food substance. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, I take I use protein powder on a daily basis, mm-hmm. but I don't want to count that as one of my supplements because I don't okay. I don't really view it that way. Um, before I go to the gym, now pre workouts are kind of a big thing right now, and I'm yeah. overall I'm just not a fan of pre workouts. <laughs> That's I got um, I got asked, but that was the very first time that I ever got asked. They said, yeah. they said, hey, what's your uh, favorite pre workout? And I said, water. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I guess if you have to pick one, that's right. what it is. Yeah. But, but most, water most doesn't them, water doesn't give you that charge. No, well, you know? and that's the problem is that charge. You know, you see all these 
all these gifs that show Macho Man Randy Savage or the Ultimate Warrior, and it says, oh, when your pre-workout kicks in. And right. if your pre-workout's making you feel that way, well, number one, most of these, so you're getting basically what I've seen in these is a lot of sugar, uh, caffeine, taurine. It's basically a monster drink. You're 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 making you're you're, you're it's like yeah. a Kool Aid version of monster drink because you're reconstituting from yeah. powder. And they'll throw in a little bit of niacin to give you that kind of hot prickly feeling, so it kind yeah. of feels like so it's like, doing Whoa. something. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's no performance enhancing benefits from niacin. It just you, you just feel it. You're like, oh right. man, this, this stuff's yeah. strong. Um, but bottom line on on those is um, they do it. You'll get you will work harder in the gym with a pre workout, but it has nothing to do with any of the other ingredients with the exception of caffeine, right. um, you'll get the same benefit. The The actual performance enhancing properties of caffeine, um, we've known about those for a long time, right. which is why they test for it at the Olympics. You can't, you can't like right. load on caffeine and go perform in the Olympics because it, uh, it actually, it does improve performance. Mm -hmm. Um, it improves, um, your perceived exertion. So you can be working really hard and think it doesn't quite feel that bad when you have caffeine in your system versus not. Um, so all the other stuff that goes into into these energy drinks, the the evidence that they actually help you perform is it's basically zilch um, at this point. And again, those things are not cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, these little things of, of uh, I was looking at Costco the other day at, at um, they had a whole rack of pre workout stuff in there, and like thirty bucks for a little can of that stuff. And mm -hmm. um, you know, imagine you probably go through that in under a month. Mm -hmm. um, so just have some caffeine and like you said, drink some water. Well, drive, um, drive to the gym with the window rolled down and some loud music playing. Yes. It's almost the same yes. effect. <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Now that it's starting to warm up here, I can, I can do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I will have a little bit of caffeine before I go. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do one of those little five hour energies, which has under a hundred milligrams, I think of caffeine. So it's not a huge yeah. shot. Um, um, sometimes I'll have some coffee, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I occasionally have a diet, you know, rock star or something like that. I'm trying to cut back on those. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, if you want a performance enhancing drug to take before you work out, mm -hmm. caffeine is where it's at. Um, the rest of that stuff, I, you know, it, it either has no effect mm -hmm. or there's potentially some, some issues with, Bad, yeah. um, you know, raising your blood pressure, um, abnormal heart rhythms. Uh, we saw a few, you know, I remember it, we were at Walter, not Walter Reed, but at Wolford Hall, some of the BMTs and tech students who would occasionally come in with, you know, heart rates in the 180s because they they downed a bunch of pre workout before yep. their PT tests. I've seen it, you know, multiple, you, I mean, multiple times in the ER. Me, me yep. too, mm -hmm. me too, yeah. You know, and they come in all jittery and everything like that. So, um, but you know, that's not what you want. No. So don't spend the money on that stuff. Just, just if you want anything, if you're going to do anything, just. A little water and some caffeine, you know, I think, is, uh, and, is the way to go. You know what I've actually just very recently, like over the last week, started doing as a, as a pre-workout? Because um, mm -hmm. I'm – like you, I try to restrict my carbohydrates. Um, 45 minutes before a workout, I'll eat one banana. Sure. And yeah. I found that the, yeah. en the yeah. energy level – that's like 27 grams of carbohydrates. It's all fructose. And mm -hmm. I found just mm -hmm. the, the energy level that I get just from that banana, it mm -hmm. like like gives mm -hmm. me a little kick in the ass. If I'm if I'm feeling That's all you need. Yeah, if I'm feeling a little bit, you know, sludgy before going, usually right before hopping in the car to drive to drive to the gym, I'll eat one banana. And uh really yeah. I'm really surprised at, at how yeah. uh, and and uh one morning in particular, uh I, I knew I was going in to do strength. So, and we'll talk about post workout uh, in a minute. But mm -hmm. um, in addition to making my recovery protein drink, I had one before going. I did my normal um, eight ounce uh, uh, protein whey protein drink, and I mixed a banana in with it. Drank that, mm -hmm. rinsed rinsed out my uh, blender ball uh, cup, uh, mixed my post workout recovery whey protein, and drove to the gym. And that made a huge difference Perfect. for me because I, you know, I didn't. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I went at kind of an odd time, so it's like ah, I don't want to go on a, I don't want to have a full breakfast and go on a full stomach, but I need something. Yeah. And I just did that. Yeah, you don't need a hundred grams of powdered sugar with, you know, caffeine and guana and um, yeah. niacin and all this other crap in there. Right. Um, yeah, it's just it's just not necessary. So, yeah, 
post workout. But that's it. That's all I do pre workout. Now post workout, I bring a protein shake with me. Um, I like to mix some flax oil into my um, into my protein shakes to get a little bit of extra fat. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally like the taste of it. Uh, I know it's not everybody's cup of tea per se, um, but there's there is this anabolic window that they talk about after mm-hmm. you've you know done a heavy bout of of resistance exercise where you can spike uh, protein synthesis and you know the, with the idea that in the long term you're going to get more muscle mass mm-hmm. um, and it's been there's been some conflicting data uh, that I've seen in terms of how just how long that window is. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to think it was like you got to get it in within 45 minutes, uh, or else you're, you know, that's it. It's too late. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably not the case. It's probably a whole lot longer than we actually think. It's probably more like six hours plus. Oh wow. Um, so ha- not knowing, I just err on the side of caution. I always have a pre mixed shake. I just leave it in my car. I do you know, the same and I, thing. I drink it on the way home. Yeah, yeah so, it, it's. Um, I'm, hung, way, I'm I'm hungry you know, afterwards anyway, so <laughs> yeah, it takes exactly. me thirty minutes to get home. Exactly. So. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's uh, the first thing I want to do when I get done training is usually eat because yeah. um, I you know I don't like to go in there on a full stomach. Um, so yeah, so I just do it then. So you know, can I give you the? Can I tell you exactly what the optimal window is now? But just, just have some, have some protein afterwards, <laughs> you know. And like I said, I just keep it in my car; it makes it yeah. easy. That way, I don't forget. So. What's your opinion on, you know, whey protein tends to be my staple, and I think that tends yeah, to be too. most people's. Um, do you think you know, I've tried some of the other ones? Some of the I've tried some of the mm-hmm. vegan ones, and they just to, it's not because I don't think yeah. they're equally bioavailable i just think they taste like crap <laughs> is my they do opinion. yeah a lot yeah. of them do yeah. a lot of them do so what i do sometimes um in my in my morning shake uh is i mix some hemp protein mm-hmm. in with it there you know in with my whey uh in addition to you know the flax and a bunch of other things now, now hemp in my opinion on its own I mean, I'd, I'd probably rather just mow my lawn and, and eat the, the clippings because right. um, <laughs> it's it's pretty foul stuff in my opinion. But if you look at its nutrient profile, it's actually pretty darn good. It's actually one of the few complete proteins that you can find in the in the vegan world. Uh, but it's also pure. It's it's pure fiber. I mean, there's just there's tons of fiber in it. So um, especially when I'm going particularly low on my carbohydrates and you know I'm maybe skimping here and there on my green leafy vegetables, which I try not to do, but the the hemp uh, definitely helps with that. So um, so if you're going to go with a with a vegetarian or a vegetable source of of protein, I I would stay away from pea protein and and some of the other ones and just go with hemp. Uh, just keep in mind that it's yeah, you got to mix it with something, in my yeah. opinion. It's just, it's just it's kind of gnarly. Yeah, um, I do my my, so, um, my way with uh, um. It says you can do it with water, but I just do it with almond milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My girlfriend does that too. Yeah. She likes almond milk a that, lot. That's oh, so, is, is that that sounds yep. like it, there's no way you can say that, and it doesn't sound like an insult. My girlfriend does that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean it that way. Mike. She's, no, it's she's all good. Jacked. It's all good. Um, <laughs> Do you find, in addition to taking a, a protein, you know, having a protein shake around a workout, do you also have to seek out any in capsule form or in powder form, you know, individual branch chain amino acids or anything like that? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I used to really be all about those, um, in specifically the BCA powders. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've kind of changed my tune recently, and I, I haven't, you know, I haven't settled the issue in my mind because I like. You know, like we're saying, but it's just we need to need, need, need a lot more research. But um, particularly if you're in a caloric deficit, um, so if you're you know you're cutting weight for a jiu-jitsu match, or you know if you're a bodybuilder trying to get on stage, the idea is well you you can take BCAAs. They have very few calories, but then they'll help you you know hold on to your lean muscle mass. And there were some studies that showed, and eh, maybe that's the case. But the more recent stuff shows that that's probably not the case. Um, and that they sometimes might actually, the, the three different, um, branch chain of meso, amino acids, it's, there's leucine, isoleucine, and valine, that if you take a big slug of all three of those, that they might actually compete with each other, um, and sort of inhibit their own absorption. I mean, this is all sort of fringe, um, you know, research level stuff. Um, and I don't really know for sure if it's going to end up having any like real world clinical significance. Um, but, um, I've kind of backed off on those. Now I do, I have some BCA powder, but you know, I, uh, I drink it on my night shifts. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. because I like the taste of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it keeps me from getting hungry because mm-hmm. uh, I'm starving on my night shifts and I, I don't want to screw up my, my diet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it helps me stay hydrated and then I, I you know, I have a little bit of uh, appetite suppression mm-hmm. from uh, the BCA powder. And not and again, not a lot of calories, which is what I need at night. Right. Um, so, um, so that for me, that's the role I think that they play. Um, you know, do I think that they're essential if you're an athlete, if you're trying to gain muscle mass? Nope, not at all. Mm-hmm. Get some good whey isolate. Um, you'll get all the branched chain amino acids you need um, from that. And um, and they're expensive. You know, they're just like pre workouts. I mean, that's some of these little these little jars are like. 40, 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, and they want you to do like three scoops a day, which are going to last you about a month. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you have unlimited resources and, and money's not an issue, then, I mean, we could take this call another two hours talking about stuff you could try. But um, it, I, in my opinion, BCA power doesn't make a cut right now. Yeah. Um, if I hear anything different, I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> for the, right for now, I, I don't think for those that aren't familiar with it, so branch chain amino acids, so proteins are made out of amino acids. Um, they're the building blocks of protein. And the, the school of thought for a long time, I know this, especially back in the 80s and 90s, the school of thought was, well, hey, if, if we're taking, if we're supplementing with branch chain amino acids, then we've stripped away the protein to the the portions of the protein mm-hmm. that we actually need to build muscle, and it was it was really looked upon um, as almost a holy grail in the fitness world that this is we are getting the part of the protein we need, none of the bad stuff associated with it. Yep. This is going to go, you know, it's you know directly going directly to the muscle and building muscle. That's right. And uh, as it turns yep. out now, and, and this was that was really kind of the first studies. You know, people think of the studies of micronutrients as being something relatively mm-hmm. new over the last 10 to 15 years, but that's something that was really micronutrient study going way, way back. But as you said, it, it looks like oh, yeah. now, as long as you're getting whey isolate or, or something that's, that's good in the form yeah. of a complete protein, it's probably, I mean, these are, these are the way that are, this is the way that our body was meant to, to digest it anyway. You know, that's, that's what, exactly. one of the things we've discovered exactly. over the years is, is kind of dis, the more you digest things in kind of in their food form, it does tend to make mm-hmm. it easier because that's how your our body through the digestive system through Absolutely. the through the the liver and through the uh, circulatory system how it was designed to kind of deliver those products uh, in the way that they're they're exactly needed. So that's so probably, Mike. You're telling me you don't you you don't approve of uh, cleanse liver cleanses and uh, no, that's a dude. We can like talk that. about that for hours. But we're not going to get into that. <laughs> Real quick yeah. before we move on, so we're we're at post workout. Real quick before we move on to the evening. Yeah, uh, and and if you're going to cover it there, we can talk about it then. Do you do any type of uh, do you do coconut oil at all? So I put a little bit. We didn't mention that earlier, but a little bit of coconut oil in my coffee uh-huh. in the morning, um, and um, I do it for two reasons. Uh, one, I like the taste. Yeah, um, and um, it uh, it goes a long way towards curbing my appetite. Yeah, um, in the morning, I don't know that there's you know it, we can talk more in detail i guess about mct supplementation because mm-hmm. there might be some benefit for um you know for athletes in that in that regard and uh you know coconut oil is a good natural source of mcts but um as far as suppressing appetite i think it's it's pretty good um yeah. i like the taste of it yeah. um and I, I know you you've been using it for a while as well i i have and uh i'm a fan of the medium chain triglycerides and now yeah. uh at the gym where denise and i are going uh, my trainer and I haven't talked about it, but her trainers talked to her about it, about her taking coconut oil, uh, basically as mm-hmm. like a pre, as a pre-workout. So to give you some MCT yeah. fuel to burn as mm-hmm. you're doing your workout, which I think is a great idea. I think it's great in coffee. And one of the things that, that I've talked to people mm-hmm. about in coffee is not only does it taste good, uh, so you, it does three things for me in coffee. Number one, it tastes great. Um, number two, you're getting the benefit of those medium chain triglycerides. So you're getting mm-hmm. healthy fats mm-hmm. to burn, uh, to sustain you, especially, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet. And the third thing is the, the fat cells. And, and you remember this, of course, from, from micro microbiology or for, from, uh, microchemistry, um, mm-hmm. they, they line up in such a way that they form these little balls called mycels around the individual right. caffeine molecules. Yeah. So instead of getting a huge caffeine slug and then crashing, 
your body has to break down the fat, op- basically open up mm-hmm. this little Christmas present with the caffeine molecule on the inside, and it's doing that almost one at a time. So you're getting caffeine, 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 kind of sustained throughout the morning and into the early mm-hmm. afternoon. And I've found it, it makes a huge difference. Um, I've, uh, I'll do coconut oil sometimes. I also do these things that we can get down here in Texas now. There's a company that makes these things called coffee bombs that are made mm-hmm. out of uh, grass-fed butter with coconut oil. Sometimes there's, a, <laughs> there's cacao and some other stuff in it. And it's, sure. it, it looks like a pad of butter. Like you would put on your pancakes, mm-hmm. it's a little bit bigger, um, mm-hmm. and you drop it in the coffee and blend it, and it kind of frosts it up, and uh, mm-hmm. it's got a lot of really good healthy fat in it. Makes the coffee taste better, yeah. and also gives you, like I say, it gives you a sustained caffeine release instead of uh, you burning it up all at once. Yeah, and anyway, anecdotally, I've noticed the exact same thing. Is my energy level um, is is nice and sustained for several hours. You know, after I have that, and I attribute that partially to you know being on a ketogenic diet, which really does help with, for me anyway, mental focus, mm-hmm. clarity, that kind of stuff. But um, it does seem like I get a little more bang for my buck when, <laughs> for, in terms of my caffeine uh, when I do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and your explanation, I think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, I just, I just realized so, I accidentally referred to biochemistry as microchemistry. So I know I'm probably going to no. get <laughs> yeah, correction emails for that. So I corrected myself. <laughs> so yeah. let's, uh, you're let's, in the ballpark. Man. I'm in the ballpark. Let's, let's move on to, to the evening. So what do you, what do you take you know, okay. before, uh, and do you do it, uh, with your evening meal? Do you do it right before bed? Do you spread it out? What do you take? So I'm, I usually end up doing it just before bed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, um, you know, I eat my evening meal. Um, I'm not a night owl, mm-hmm. so I, I don't, I don't go to bed. Or I, uh, I don't stay up too much <laughs> these days, like past nine o'clock. Um, cause I like to get up early and get my day started. But, um, so my evening, you know, there's a repeat again. So I take, um, you know, my creatine, I take my other doses of fish oil. Um, and that's in the nighttime. The only difference is I add in magnesium, uh, which is another one of those super important ones right up there with vitamin D in my oh, opinion yeah. that, um, that almost everybody should be taking. Um, and the reason I say that is there's some, been some studies out showing that, um, it's like up to two thirds of the U S population actually is magnesium deficient. Mm-hmm. Um, meaning they don't even hit the RDA. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know exactly what the optimal level is, but it's, it's most likely it's higher than what the RDA is. And, and we, um, we but, do know and, that, that ele- that hyper magnesemia, elevated magnesium mm-hmm. does not yeah. occur in the wild. Yeah, that's correct. It so does your not, body has, yeah, it, you can't find it out of hospital. Like literally the it only place exist. you find it for reasons we don't even need to talk about is in the, on the postpartum nope. ward. And we won't talk about that. That's exactly why. right. <laughs> but <laughs> we any physicians not, listening are nodding their heads. Either. Right. Uh, but Brings you, back bad memories. Right. But you don't find it out, out in the wild because no. you, you're, you're going to pee it off. Exactly. Yeah. And your intestine actually has these, these cells that are in there. Then, and one of their jobs is to regulate how much magnesium you absorb. So, you know, if you're, if your blood levels are low, your, these little cells will allow you to extract more magnesium from what you eat. And if you're saturated, which almost nobody is, then you'll absorb less. Um, but you touched on it, you know, before it's, um, you know, a lot of this is as a result of the depletion of our soil, you know, our farm, farmland has been farmed and farmed and farmed. So the amount of magnesium in the soil is, uh, certainly lower than it was, you know, a hundred, 200 years ago. Um, uh, so this is like an extremely common problem. Um, and, um, like vitamin D, I mean, magnesium is important for everything. I mean, you and I use it in the emergency department all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite drugs because yeah. uh, it works for so many different things, you know, sure. abnormal heart rhythms. Mm-hmm. Um, y- you, can, you can prevent, uh, you know, seizures in pregnant yep. women that have yep. preeclampsia with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I asthmatics, give, I give it to- if you're dying of an asthma attack. Yep. All my asthmatic patients get it and all of my headache patients get it. Yep. Yeah, so exactly. So for migraines, it can help. Um, and again, unless you start pushing the dose to ridiculous levels, it's, it's incredibly safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the odds are anybody that walks through your emergency room door, you know, there's a two and three chance that they're baseline magnesium deficient as it is. Yeah. So, um, so you're probably in pretty good standing if you, if you just, maybe you should give it out in the waiting room. Yeah. I don't know. 
but we use it, you know, the point there, we use it for a lot of different stuff in mm-hmm. multiple different organ systems because your entire, every tissue in your body needs it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually the second most common electrolyte in your body after sodium. Mm-hmm. So, you know, pretty important. And it's shocking how low, uh, or how common, you know, um, the, uh, you know, inadequate intake is. So, so this is another thing, um, you know, there are tests you can do for magnesium. The ones that we get in the ER, the serum, just regular blood magnesium is probably not the best because right. magnesium tends to, it lives inside your cells. Um, and so the concentrations there are much higher. Um, so you're not really getting an accurate idea if you just ask your doc for a regular magnesium blood test uh there's a bunch of other ones the most common one is the red blood cell magnesium so they just break down some of your red blood cells and they measure what's actually inside your red blood cells it's a little bit more costly but if you really want to know where you're at um that's the way to do it um probably the best thing to do honestly is just start taking some mag- magnesium supplements i mean there's it's, it's going to cost you pennies yeah pennies on the dollar yeah um, and almost certainly you'll stand to benefit from it. And the thing that I tell people is the reason that it's important to take it at night is it does tend to make you sleepy. And I, it does. I take yeah, it, I take it as a that, sleep yeah. aid. I take it as a sleep aid. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, um, mm-hmm. one of the things when we, when we run our sheepdog courses, people show up that first day, especially in the civilian courses, a lot of them have never grappled before. Um, we spend the whole right. first half of the day just beating them up uh, on the combatives mat, and then the whole afternoon mm-hmm. they're at the range. And I tell everybody at the end of the day, uh, you know, T- Tim always tells everybody, go home, drink water, eat a, eat a clean, healthy meal. And I tell them, I say, you mm-hmm. know, hey, you know, I reemphasize the water especially, and I say, hey, you know, everybody take six to eight hundred milligrams of Motrin before you go to bed, and take <laughs> take two hundred and fifty milligrams to five hundred milligrams of magnesium. Uh, because yeah, it's, I think such, that's good it's such I think that's a good potent muscle relaxant. I mean, it goes a long way mm-hmm. uh, towards alleviating muscle spasm. And people don't realize that these little, these little tiny, all the the smooth muscle. When we're talking about capillaries and we're talking mm-hmm. about yep. in the alveoli and your lungs, that's why it works for uh, asthmatics. So if you're relaxing that smooth yep. muscle, that means when you're exercising, you're able to get deep, deep breaths. You're able to fill your entire lung yep. capacity. It's going to increase your VO2 max. If you're relaxing Absolutely. the muscles in the capillary beds, you're getting better perfusion. You're getting better blood flow to your fingertips, yeah. to uh, all of your tissues, to your muscles. And that's – that's. I'm convinced You know, they, they, they go back and forth on why it works in headaches. And I'm convinced that that's why is it's relaxing the capillary beds and it's giving you better cerebral perfusion. Um, so I think it's a yeah, good Yeah, I, I think there's medication. probably something to that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Magnesium is, is huge. Um the RDA is around 400 milligrams a day, which again, most people fall well shy of that. Um, I don't honestly, I don't, I have not seen anything that says, you know, what, this is the amount that is optimal for your health. Um, I personally take 800 milligrams. Yeah, I take um, five because I, I, know I targeted it, five. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably just complete. It's yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really just pulling the number out of, you know, where, mm-hmm. um, if, if you start pushing that dose higher, I mean, you can get some gastrointestinal side effects. Mm-hmm. Um, as you know, cause we prescribe magnesium citrate to do bowel cleanses and get constipated people, right. you know, cleaned out and stuff like that. So yeah. and and you- that's many, many grams. And you can also, if you're if you're a quick twitch athlete, too much can blunt that a little bit. You do get a little bit of uh, hyporeflexia. That's true. And it's if yeah. you if you're somebody if you're listening to this and you're somebody with sleep apnea, I would mm-hmm. advise you to go between 250 and 500 and not over 500 because it does blunt your respiratory drive a little bit. Yeah, at least at least start there. Yeah, you know what I mean, and and then go you know adjust slowly. Yeah. Um, but it's uh yeah it's it's super important. Um, the other thing too is, uh, I mean, how many people do we see walking around on blood pressure medicine? Yeah. You know, it's uh, everybody, at least in the ER, everybody's got hypertension. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and that's really important in magnesium. You can reliably knock several points off of your, both your systolic Definitely. and diastolic blood yep. pressure. Yeah. Um, just by supplementing with, with a small amount of magnesium. Mm. Um, and that could be the difference between your doctor wanting you to put on, put you on medication versus not, yeah. uh, if you're right on that on that borderline. So, yeah. um, 
Absolutely. And that gets back to the smooth muscle relaxing properties that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, but you know, good data on blood pressure for sure. I, I'd like to see a study in, it, it, even in this day and age, we're still having doctors tell their patients to, to primarily, when they, when they first get diagnosed with prehypertension or, you know, early hypertension, um, sodium restriction tends to be something a lot of primary care physicians run yeah. to right away, even though right. <laughs> we've had a lot of mixed studies that say whether or not that even works. Yeah. I'd like to see a study where you take 100 people, you know, take take 200 people that uh, are in the stages of prehypertension, take 100 of them and sodium restrict them, take the other 100 and magnesium supplement them. And I'll exactly. bet the magnesium be supplementation. I bet the magnesium supplementation group. If there is an, a resident somewhere listening to this podcast, email me, and I will uh, I'll, I will co-author this study with you, um, so so we can get published. But I'm 100 percent convinced, uh, anecdotally anyway, that there's something to be yeah. had there. I think you're total. I think you're absolutely right, especially now that we know how prevalent magnesium deficiency is. Um, and of course, you know what's one of the first things that happens uh, for a lot of people with high blood pressure? You get put on a diuretic, right, right for your so blood pressure. You're losing, you're losing so you're, all your magnesium. So you're losing even yeah. more. Yeah, yeah you're just peeing out even more right. magnesium. Yeah, and then so, um, and then yeah. you get put on a beta blocker because the diuretic uh, didn't work. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> exactly. So when really what you should be doing is high intensity exercise, getting your body fat as low as possible and supplementing with magnesium. And, and getting eight hours and getting eight hours of good sleep every night. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And if you have uh, sleep apnea, get that treated and looked into mm-hmm. as well. Um, there's a lot of stuff that causes hypertension that is reversible mm-hmm. um, and it doesn't necessarily require you to start taking medication. Right. Uh, that's a whole other podcast we can talk about right. but um you know, that, that magnesium's a no-brainer for me. Yeah. It's so cheap. There's multiple different kinds you'll see on, on they're, they're all roughly the same. There's minor variations in absorption. Yeah. The mag citrate's what I take. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's pennies. Yeah. I mean, I think a month's supply of magnesium costs me like $9 or something. I'm seeing a um, lot of uh, mag-calcium combo pills now, which I like because I like the idea of taking mm-hmm. calcium at night. Sure, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And for, you know, for women, especially who might not be getting the, the 1200 milligrams a day that they're supposed to be getting of their calcium, um, you know, that might not, that's, yeah, that's a good option. Yeah. What, um, what else, uh, what else do you advocate? So we talked about, you take your night creatine, you take your magnesium. What else do you take at night? So really honestly that Mike, that's it. Um, really? now, well, that's it as far as the core supplements that I would recommend. Um, now I take a few other things, um, that I, uh, because I have familial high cholesterol, Mm -hmm. um, and the men in my family tend to drop dead in their forties from heart disease. So I keep very close tabs on my lipids. So I take, um, uh, plant sterols, Mm -hmm. um, at night. Um, and I also take pantothene, which, um, is a, uh, it's a vitamin B5 derivative, Mm -hmm. um, that has, if you look at the cholesterol lowering properties of it, it's, it's about as good as some of the weaker statins that are out there. Huh. And it's just a water soluble, um, you know, variant of, uh, panathenic acid, which is vitamin B5. They use it overseas a lot as a prescription drug, but in the States it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a vitamin. So, um, but I'd never heard about it in med school or in family medicine residency. Um, probably because quite honestly, there's, there's no money in it, you know? All right. Um, so I take that, so I, I don't, you know, I don't universally recommend that, but there's a whole nother list of supplements that depending on what kind of medical predispositions you have or medical conditions that might help things like resveratrol, um, I think would very promising, which is one of the active ingredients in red wine. Um, so if you're a diabetic, um, if you have heart disease, uh, you know, that might be a good idea to supplement with that. I don't recommend that for your average Joe, you know, until I see better data on it. Just same with the panathene. I mean, if you're, if your lipids are looking okay, um, you don't need to take panathene per se. But again, if you're one of these folks that's right on the borderline, your doc wants to put you on a statin and you're not quite sure. In addition to the exercise, and um, the diet and the weight loss, you can supplement with panathene. Um, I do 600 milligrams twice a day. Um, and that has, you know, bumped my, my points, uh, my cholesterol, you know, into the range that I'm happy with. So, um, so I take that at night as well. 
Okay. But that's that's kind of unique to my own particular medical issue, which is is this is you know familial hyperlipidemia right. so, um, as well. And I don't like to take statins if I can I can help it. I'm not anti-statin, but um, you know I do get muscle soreness with it. Yeah. I feel like it, it takes me longer to recover. Um, and with my lifestyle and with 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 the panathene and the uh, the plant sterols, I've got my LDL down under 100, and I'm happy with that. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, and you mentioned calcium, especially for, for women, obviously. What other, mm-hmm. when, when we're talking about women, are there any, in addition to the types of things that we already talked about, is there anything that you recommend uh, that, you know, women, because obviously different metabolic, you know, boys and girls are different. Mm-hmm. We learned it in kindergarten and we confirmed it in med school. That's right. <laughs> um, That's right. What uh, what should they be taking that most of them aren't? Well, you know, we're, we're different, but at, at in so many ways, we're still the same. So all of this stuff I just said applies equally to women. Mm-hmm. Um, vitamin D maybe more so just because of the bone health issues. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the, the um, you know, preventive services task force and things like that are out there starting to back away from calcium supplementation mm-hmm. um, because, you know, it's, there's theoretically higher levels of calcium intake can you know can deposit into your arterial wall and we think that that's associated with you know atherosclerosis and heart disease and stiff arteries and that sort of thing so um the last time i looked the uh, recommendations for um for you know adult women and postmenopausal women are still around 1200 milligrams a day um which again ideally you should get from from dietary sources so again mostly dairy um, if, if you can't do dairy for some reason, um, and you can't do red meat and that sort of stuff for ethical reasons or other, other reasons, then, um, you know, you could consider some low dose supplementation, but, but taking it with vitamin D is pretty important because there, there's some synergy there, um, as well. But I would not recommend, at least at this point, um, I wouldn't recommend taking more than the 1200 milligrams a day, um, just out of concern for maybe some long-term vascular issues. Um, but again, that's, that's still one of those big things that needs to get worked out, you know, over time. So, but, um, yeah, as, bottom line is all this stuff applies to women, right. you know, as well, just like, just like with men, especially if, if, if you know, if they're hard training athletes, right. just like men, they lose, well, they lose magnesium. Um, you know, they still stand to benefit from fish oil and all the other things we talked about. So, so yeah, we're different, but we're not, we're not all that different, right. you know? One of the things that I was told uh, quite some time ago was do the D3 in the AM and do the calcium in the PM, uh, the thought process mm-hmm. being the bone remodeling that takes uh, that takes place overnight, you were giving your body mm-hmm. kind of a ready supply of calcium. Do you think there's anything to that? I mean, it, it makes sense from a biochemistry standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just not aware of any studies showing that it that it makes, you know, in the long term, does it make a difference? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we probably never will. I mean, it, it, bone formation and bone breakdown is so slow. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes decades. So you'd have to have a study that, that has a, you know, a group of compliant patients probably for at least five to 10 years to see if it makes any difference in the amount of bone that's laid down. Um, that, that, that study might be out there. I don't know. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense to do that, but um, I, I'll have an opinion one way or the other on it. Yeah, at this point. You know, and that's so. you know, there was a big scare, of course, uh, where you know osteoporosis, osteo and osteopenia being a factor, especially in women. But I think if yeah. if, if you you know, again, we talk about confounders in studies, and if you take uh, if you take out cigarette smoking, which we we know is t- terrible for the entire body, but also huge Absolutely. contributor to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Mm-hmm. If you take out that. Mm-hmm. And you add in um, some load-bearing exercise, which is going to force your body to do bone remodeling. I think you've mm-hmm. pretty much solved the problem. I don't think it was ever as much of a dietary issue as it was a bad habits issue, number one, and yeah. also yeah. Uh, uh, a, a, the D3 issue. Because you know, in, in order for you to yeah. make maximum yeah. use out of that calcium, it was D three deficiency, I think, more than it was dietary calcium deficiency. Because you talk, you talk Absolutely. about it, a, a generation, the generation that that I think has the the most, if we look at the data, has the most osteoporosis and osteopenia is my mother's generation, and they all drank yeah. whole milk their entire lives, but they all all started smoking in their teens. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. so, so that's, and none of them were getting enough D3. So I, I think all yeah. of these, and they weren't throwing kettle, contrib- kettlebells around. They either. weren't throwing kettlebells. They weren't doing squats. They weren't doing deadlift. So, uh, yeah. you know, an, an, an argument for, for all of those types of exercise as well. Um, yeah, iron, absolutely. iron supplementation in women still of childbearing age. Um, you know, I, I don't universally recommend it, um, unless you're iron deficient. Okay. You know, quite honestly, but that's a quick test. You know, that's an easy test. Right. Um, if, if, um, you know, as a woman, if you have had heavy menses for many, many years and, um, uh, you know, that might be worth checking in into, especially if you're planning on getting pregnant. Um, there's a whole battery of tests you should do to try to get yourself in optimal health before you, before you conceive. Um, and, um, and just getting a basic CBC and looking at, um, you know, some of the indices on that can clue your doctor in as to whether you need additional iron. Um, so, uh, I don't universally recommend it, um, unless I've got a suspicion, gotcha. you know, that this person's iron deficient, gotcha. uh, cause there's some serious GI side effects with, with oral iron. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, really, there really are. I, oh, yeah. I mean, at least half of the folks that I prescribe iron to, they, they just stop taking it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of the stomach upset and the constipation and stuff like that. So, um, you know, we actually have an infusion center at the hospital I work that, you know, people come in and they get IV iron, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is insanely expensive, but they can't, they can't get their levels up by taking it by mouth for a variety of different reasons. So, um, yeah, it's important, but you know, again, it's, uh, I don't, I wouldn't recommend universally, um, you know, recommending it to every woman out there. Gotcha. Well, cool, man. Uh, any anything else? Anything we any supplementation that we haven't covered that you'd like to cover? You know, I think that's that's the core right there. I think those the ones we talked about. I think have the best data mm-hmm. on them. Um, you know, I touched on a few of the extras you know, a little bit with the resveratrol and the panathene, and um, you know, we can do a part two later on on specific sure. supplements for specific medical conditions. Yeah. But as far as this, you know. It, as a as a small number of very inexpensive supplements that almost everybody stands to benefit from, um, those are the ones we just talked about. I mean, if, if you take all of those, it's it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be terribly expensive, and um, almost everybody stands to gain from from doing that. So so less pre workout, more fish oil, more magnesium, more water. More hard work. More water, more PT. That, that cures almost everything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Drew, yeah I, as our I, buddy used to say, more fluid, more fiber, more physical training. Yep, yeah. That's what you yeah, need. Yeah, good friend of ours <laughs> is famous for saying that. So. Yep. Drew, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. This has been a wealth of information. I know we're going to get... Uh, My pleasure, buddy. We're going to get a lot of emails, a lot of contact for this, I'm sure. Uh, now, Drew's book, uh, tell, tell him about the title of your book. Sure. So it's, you can find it on Amazon. That's currently the the main place where it's. Uh, but I'd you can rather, buy it if you're but I'd rather or, you find it at the Sheepdog store. <laughs> <laughs> so you thank you. Just took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. get it from the Sheepdog guys. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's called the program Personal Evolution. Um, I wrote it uh, a number of years ago. I started it when I was um, deployed in. Uh, in the Balad area of Iraq uh, years ago, and continued on it after that. So, um, just some of my thoughts on diet, nutrition, exercise, that sort of thing. So, if you're interested, check it out. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, I've got a dog-eared copy of it uh, right here next to me. Uh, most of the people that work for Sheepdog have read it and swear by it. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't sell, sell it on the store, which we do. I'll have a link to that uh in the show notes so if you want to click on it and buy drew's book which i highly encourage you to do so you'll be able to i'll also have a link to to drew's uh instagram feed so you can follow him on instagram brother i really appreciate you coming on uh it's been a Anytime, wealth of information Mike. man i appreciate pleasure. it great gonna, to catch up i'm gonna finish it up today with a quote by mr william butler yeats who said do not wait to strike till the iron is hot but make it hot by striking. Remember that, everybody, and until next time, be a sheepdog. You have been listening to The Sheepdog Project. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash sheepdog response. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the individual and do not represent any larger entity, public or private.